Our next presenter is Dale Gentry. And Dale, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you very much. It's uh, an honor to be able to talk with you all today. I wish we were all in San Diego face to face, but, uh, but we do what we can. I am a professor of biology at the University of Northwestern in St. Paul, Minnesota. I'm an ecologist and ornithologist uh, and evolutionary biologist. And I also am the executive director of a nonprofit called Disciple Science, which is making uh, videos and a podcast to talk about the intersection of science and faith. And today I want to talk about um, our sort of what I think divorce of a, from the traditional Christian theology of nature and the consequences of that and how to address it. I want to start with these words from uh, there are some who can live without wild things and some who cannot. This is the opening line to Aldo Leopold's iconic Sand County Almanac, which back in the 1950s helped us see and understand the modern connection of humans with nature and the landscape, which led to ultimately the birth of the modern environmental revolution. And uh, you won't be surprised to hear that uh, Aldo Leopold had a lot of company. Most humans feel connected to nature. We like spending time in the outdoors. We're interested in animals. This pattern is so prominent that it was is now being studied. Um, Harvard entomologists and, and uh, two-time uh, Pulitzer Prize winner E.O. Wilson coined the term biophilia to describe the innate human tendency connect to connect with nature and other forms of life. And uh, he and his uh, secular colleagues are working to try and explain this pattern within humanity that seems to be fairly unique to humans among, among the vertebrates, a deep interest in emotional connection with other forms of life. Now, I want to argue that uh, Christian theology has a lot to say about this, but that that message is largely missing within um, especially the public perception of Christianity. I would say that the, the biophiles in our society, the biologists, the en environmental science, uh, the naturalists and uh, nature lovers tend not to associate their affinity with nature, with any religious tradition, and certainly not with Christianity. And so I think that the Christian theology of nature, at least the aspect of it talking about uh, creation as a revelation of God's goodness, is, um, is can adequately cover this to some degree, not that it won't also be explained with, uh, with evolutionary mechanisms, but that our failure to emphasize this part of our theology renders our faith irrelevant to the people in my circles, the biologists, the environmental scientists, the conservation biologists who, who think that Christianity has nothing to offer. Let me elaborate on this with greater detail. I promise I won't read these verses to you. I, I suspect most of you have them memorized as I do, uh, but they invite us to see uh, a purpose in creation. At least one of the purposes in creation is to connect people to God through nature. And because of that, we have developed this theology that we're all of course familiar with that God has revealed through two books, both the, the book of scripture that we are much more comfortable with and the book of creation, which gets less airtime. And of course, this two books of Revelation metaphor first appeared in the Belgic Confession in the 16th century and helped to inform um, a long list of theologians and scientists from John Calvin and Johannes Kepler and Robert Boyle and Jonathan Edwards, among dozens and dozens of others who, who agreed that we ought to um, associate our uh, interest in science and our, our curiosity about the, the physical creation with uh, a, a pull into relationship with our creator. And yet that uh, message, which was uh, more prominent in the past, is, is largely muted in modern Western Christianity. I will briefly give props to uh, Eastern Orthodox Christianity, which is much more comfortable addressing this, but that's a topic for an, another, another session. And so I uh, address this in part because this was an issue for, for me growing up as a person who was deeply interested in nature and had never had this introduced to me and in the circles that I run in. I find that the, uh, at the, uh, in my conversations at the uh, Ecological Society of America conferences of, of sort, they have never heard that Christianity has anything to say about um, being connected with, with nature. And so I would argue that the world does not 
familiar with this aspect of the Christian theology of nature, and that that has consequences uh, numerous for both our witness to the, the people of the world that are deeply connected with creation and our ability to integrate science and faith. So uh, just as, a, as an example of this, an argu argument to support that this is largely muted in society is just how absent it is in our own messages. We talk about being Bible-believing Christians. We go to Bible churches. We talk about our, uh, the infallibility or, or inerrancy of God's word and, and our, um, our ultimate uh, authority being given to it in all matters of doing to God and, and very little else reference to creation. And what we'll find is that in the secular world, uh, many scholars will just assume that there is nothing. For example, a uh, critic of Christianity, Ludwig Furbach in the 19th century said that nature the world has no value, no interest for Christians. The Christian thinks only of himself and the salvation of his soul. We might think more charitably, he would think that we think about the salvation of other people's souls as well, but the idea remains that nature has no interest to Christians. More recently, uh, uh, environmental historian Roderick Nash said, Christian aspirations were fixed on heaven, the supposed place of their origin, and they hoped their final resting. The earth was no mother, but a kind of halfway house of trial and testing from which one was released at death. Indeed, Christians expected that the earth would not be around for long. A vengeful God would destroy it all in unredeeming, uh, and, uh, sorry, and all unredeemed nature with floods or drought or fire. So these visions of Christian eschatology, where we are whisked away from this fallen world to spend eternity with God in heaven, uh, which we have sort of gotten stuck in in the past century, have communicated to the world that this world has no interest to us. So what are the consequences of our silencing of the theology of nature? Why did we do so? And what can we do to undo some of those patterns? So I wanna talk about quickly the consequences and then spend a little bit more time talking about how we got ourselves into this mess, which will hopefully give us some directions for how to undo it. The consequences uh, are, are numerous and problematic for many reasons. Uh, first of all, it helps to understand why many Christians seem unmotivated to care for creation. They don't see creation as part of God's eternal plan they don't see purpose for it. They don't see it as much of anything beyond, beyond uh, uh, an ephemeral place for us to experience a, uh, a life where we can decide to follow Jesus or not. And therefore, um, caring for this physical creation uh, it seems pointless to some Christians. It, uh, it prevents us from communicating and witnessing our theology of biophilia to those uh, people who who feel it themselves. We see this quote from Carl Sagan, who praises the worship of the sun, not because it is a, a revelation of God, but because of a, a materialistic origin for, for humanity. And so we are, um, uh, I'm deeply aware of how many people report having spiritual experiences in nature, have an emotional connection to animals and places and yet think that there's, there's nothing that Christianity has to offer that uh, experience. And lastly, because we seem disconnected from the physical world, many Christians, as we're all aware, question the value and conclusions of the study of that world that we call science. And so this also amplifies the tensions between science and Christianity. So the origins of this distancing of the Christian theology from the distance uh, from the Christian theology of nature are numerous. I'm not going to have time to cover them all today, but I only do want to cover four points. And the first is the um, thought that came out of the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment, of course, followed closely after the Protestant Re Reformation and the Scientific Revolution. And the Enlightenment, if we can oversimplify it. Uh, Enlightenment thinkers sought a single way to understand the world. They sought universal uh, understanding so that every human that had capacities for reason, given the same information, would come to the same conclusions. Now, that was an admirable um, uh, uh, target, but we now know through uh, the study of this time that it caused problems in many ways. Here we see 
um, the idea that uh, because of our um, desire to have universal conclusions, that we should suppress our imagination. Sir Francis Bacon, uh, I'll read from the second half of his quote here, says, God forbid that we use, that we should give out a dream of our own imagination for a pattern of the world. So as we examine the world, please do not use your imagination. And I, I think many would argue the same for our approach to scripture. And this has, of course, caused many challenges. Uh, French poet and, and uh, uh, vocal Catholic Paul Claudel talked about the starved imagination of rationalism. Alistair McGrath talks about how the vestiges of the modernist suppression of the imagination still haunt the practice of systematic theology. Now, this is especially um, problematic here because an examination of nature is uh, what I would call hermeneutically imprecise. It's vague. We don't get explicit details written on the undersides of leaves that tell us that we should uh, turn away from our sinful ways and follow Jesus. And so because of this uh, lack of clarity, many people are just uncomfortable seeking understanding from this imprecise source of, of, of information. The second source of tension is just that tension between science and Christianity. The examination of nature has, has, uh, has caused uh, challenges, as we're all aware, for many aspects of Christianity. And be, uh, many people have addressed that tension through um, the, the NOMA model from Stephen Jay Gould, non-overlapping magisteria advocated also for by the National Academy of Sciences, which silos religious faith and science into two different realms of study, but by in that siloing, we basically lose our um, uh, capacity to talk about the physical world, because in that siloing, we basically say, all right, religious people, you get to talk about spirituality and the non-physical world, perhaps science, your realm is the material world, and Christianity, therefore, uh, loses its uh, um, capacity and authority to speak on the material world in the same way that science no longer is allowed to delve into the spiritual world. So that siloing, which has sort of eliminated conflict from some people's perspective, also prevents us from having any sort of cross-pollination or dialogue. The third um, aspect of this challenge, I think, is the reemergence of a, a Gnosticism, a, a more modern version of Gnosticism. The Gnostics, of course, were a heretical second century sort of pseudo-Christian movement, which held the Platonic view that everything physical was inherently evil and that only the spiritual is good and that we yearn to be uh, uh, free from our physical existence so that we can spend eternity in a spiritual form. That explicit belief doesn't really persist uh, very prominently, but we have a more modernized Gnosticism, which presents the Christian gospel as an escape from our material earth into a spiritual heaven. The earth is not perceived as part of God's eternal plan and any theology of the earth is an inferior theology and, and a, a strict adherence to only uh, biblical theology is seen of value in certain forms of Christianity. I think versions of this can be associated with the very popular uh, books and movies uh, from the, uh, uh, the, that follow the Left Behind um, strategy, Left Behind series which became very popular and are associated with sort of a dispensational eschatology. And then the last aspect of this that I wanna talk about today is the politicization of the environment. You might be surprised as I was to see the statistics from the early nineties on what percentage of Republicans and Democrats in the United States self-identify as environmentalists. Imagine for your, in a moment what those numbers would be in your head. I bet they are not equal, uh, both 78%. That same poll done about 15 years later, and we find, you won't be surprised now to find a great divide. And we have two stories here. One is that Democrats also uh, identify as environmentalists at lower levels, but that Republicans much lower, right? So what happened in this time frame that led to uh, an, uh, an issue that was fairly unilateral and bipartisan support for environmental concern and connection with environmental issues to one that's become very partisan. Well, it's hard to tra uh, trace explicitly, but many people tie it to Newt Gingrich 
and his contract with America. Many of you are probably familiar with that. So this is associated with the religious right and the emergence of the moral majority in the 1980s. The Republican resistance to environmental policy came not from really any mention of environmental issues in general, but from an adherence to restraint on regulation and a small government uh, vision of, of ideal po uh, politics. And this was happening at the same time as climate change was emerging as a serious concern and threat uh, uh, for which many policy proposals were put forth as solutions. And so deregulation from the conservatives and sort of uh, more regulation from the progressives led to a separation of, of, um, of conservatives from the environmental movement and many Christians then associate that that must how some associated with Christianity as well. So this, um, these are our explanations uh, of, of an issue. They are not reasons to abandon our theology of nature. They are, I think, aspects that we need to tackle and work on to address this concern. And I want to very briefly talk about just the start of how to uh, work through these issues, especially focusing on the imagination. And we need to um, remind ourselves, uh, even though this is a struggle for many of us, that uh, scripture is full of poetry and parables, that the Bible is full of theological metaphors, many of them connected to things from nature. We have to use our imagination to make sense out of those passages of scripture. I think they've just become so familiar that we forget that they are still metaphors and parables. And many would argue that any conception of God is derived from our imagination. We cannot conceive of an omnipotent, omnipresent, omnibenevolent God. It is uh, requires our imagination. C.S. Lewis says, for me, reason is the natural organ of truth, but imagination is, uh, produces new metaphors or reviving old is not the cause of truth, but it's condition. Um, addressing the tension between science and Christianity is something I suspect all of us are here to do. I uh, started my organization, Disciple Science, to uh, produce videos and a podcast to talk about these things in a more public way and a digestible way. I won't talk about that in any greater detail, but I'm grateful for the ASA and the work that each of us are doing to help address these tensions so that we can better integrate science and faith. So that's a, a, a big topic that I won't expand on any further. The concerns around modern Gnosticism, I think, are, 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 um, are starting to fade away. I'm especially encouraged by the embrace of, of many people's uh, rediscovery of what I think is original Christianity. Um, I, I credit most with uh, uh, associated with some of the teaching from N.T. Wright. His book, Surprised by Hope, uh, was transformational for me, and I know for many others as we help. Two-minute warning. Thank you, David. Uh, as we come to see that, um, that the uh, physical creation is part of, of God's eternal plan. It won't just be uh, disposed on the trash heap at the end of times, and that uh, the Christian mission should be associated with it. And lastly, the politicization of the environment is also being addressed by an emergence of so many um, excellent Christian earth care movements, which are independent of political affiliation. They're saying this is not a, a, a Republican issue. This is not a Democratic issue. This is a, a Christian issue. And let's have this conversation apart from our partisan affiliations. So I am encouraged that we are making progress in this, in this area. I think that we have a long ways to go, uh, but it's my hope that we would come to a point uh, in the future where we can speak with people who feel deeply, emotionally, spiritually connected with nature and say that makes perfect sense in light of God's spirit animating all of it. And it gives us a capacity to witness to the nature lovers of the world with a message of the gospel. It allows us to encounter God outside of our prayer time, outside of our Bible reading time, outside of our church time, but everywhere we go and we learn to find God in what has been created. It gives meaning to our innate desire to understand and care for the world that does seem to be present in so many humans. Of course, we want to study the world. It is a revelation of God. 
and gives us the capacity to see imagination and the arts as pathways to knowledge and help deal with some of the tension between the sciences and the humanities. And lastly, it empowers and encourages Christians that are interested in the sciences to pursue those interests and do so knowing that it is kingdom work. Uh, thank you for your attention and for your time. This is a, 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 a citation, a list of citations, and I would be happy to um, field any questions that might have popped up. Ron, I see you've got a question. Ron Myers. Okay. Um, I was looking at that quote, you know, the 78% to like 20 some and then 40 some. Is the definition of environmentalist the same? In those two times, um, I got something in the way. No, that's and a great question. I think you to this radical change. Yeah, I, I think that that is at the root of, of what has caused a lot of that change, that environmentalism, when it emerged in the 70s, was seen as a universal good. You know, we can tie that to the Nixon White House, and there was just everybody supported these things need to be done, we need to start thinking about this issue, and environmentalism just seemed as wise stewardship. Uh, and then in that time, we started to see sort of um, emergence of, of a, a sort of environmentalism, the term associated with sort of an extremist view uh, that did become associated with sometimes, you know, an, anti-human and, um, uh, you know, anti-development. Um, uh, and so, many people became uncomfortable with, with environmentalism and it got associated with extremism. So they asked the same question, but I think that the term in, in public mind had really changed over that time, which helped to explain, especially why the, why the democratic numbers went down. The language changed. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, in that time you got gayism, you had a tree, you know, people with spiking trees and a few other things like this, which, um, Yep. They're off putting. Yep. The Earth First movement. Yeah. Yeah. There were some many things that people were not anxious to be associated with. And I still find that today. Uh, people will say, I am deeply concerned about the environment, but I am not an environmentalist. Um, that term has become toxic in many circles. Yeah. Well, I sometimes will classify myself as light green. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I like that. That's great. Uh, uh, I don't know who, Paul or Stephen, raise their hands first. Paul, why don't you go ahead? Well, I, I uh, have a question. Uh, I love the talk. I love nature. I always have. I also love the Lord. Uh, I was just wondering if you were familiar with any of the works of uh, Anglican priest Malcolm Gwyde, in particular some of his writings about his biography of Samuel Taylor Coleridge, who was an Anglican theologian in the 19th century, not only a poet, but a theologian of some great depth and gave a lot of emphasis for the role of the human imagination and the renewal of the imagination in its understanding of nature. Uh, I, I am, I've seen it, that reference, but I've never read it myself. I would love, if you could send it. I think it, you uh, would love it. Yeah, I, I, I can send I it to you. Okay. I would, I would appreciate that. Even if you just want to put it in the, in the comments or email it to me, I would, I would appreciate that. Thank you. Lydia. Uh, uh, or, or Stephen, did you do you want to go next? Yeah, just, just really quickly because um, I want to hear Lydia's question. Um, I, I always found it curious that Francis Schaeffer wrote a, a really wonderful book, uh, "Pollution and the Death of Man," which seems to have been ignored by evangelicals. While you know other books that he wrote that you know tended to issues for abortion and things like that were you know like standard bearers for the movements. Uh, do you have any thought on that? Yeah, that is, I, I've found that uh, odd as well, because I encountered that book first and read it before I became aware of his role in the formation of sort of the, the, the moral majority and the, and the religious yeah. right. Not the moral majority, but the, um, it, yeah, I, I, I think it, there are just, if it's just cognitive dissonance, people are kind of letting other things overpower their thought on that, because I, in my experience, you'll find you won't find Christians that say we shouldn't be thinking about this. Not not people that have studied it, but they will say, but right. There's always a but that follows it. But these other issues should take precedence, or or but you know we don't want to you know environmentalism is going to lead us into idolatry, or there's always a but that sort of explains why even though we should be doing it, um, it shouldn't take over some other aspect of our 
either our, th our theology or, or our, our Christian living that should become a higher priority. So Lydia, why don't you ask? Yeah. So uh, I, I really appreciate your talk and I'm with you that we need to recover a theology of nature. Um, but I serve in a very urban setting. And if I tell people in my church that they should love nature, uh, they would have to leave their their place and move right. to another place. So, so how can we teach this without, say, deserting the urban areas where most people live? Yeah, that's a, a, a tremendous um, challenge, an issue of, of environmental justice that many people don't have good access to natural areas. And many of those urban parks um, may not be places where they're comfortable um, and so there are, um, you know, I, I don't, there, there are no easy solutions to this because I, I have um, um, dealt with some of this myself in, in my own life, trying to set up um, experiences for people to spend time in nature and, and, and you know, encounter challenges and getting people to, to take part in those um, across cultural, across the cultural spectrum. So I can say I'm encouraged by the work that people are doing on this. I know there's a, um, a nonprofit Black in the Outdoors that's based in San Antonio, I think, that is uh, doing great work and getting urban people into nature. Um, but it's a, a tremendous challenge, you know, and, and I think that even the, the comfort and interest in nature from people in urban environments, I, I, uh, I know many people are, are not interested in spending time in the natural world. They feel deeply uncomfortable there if they've never... Um, you know, spend a lot of time in the wilderness area. And so that's also, I think, unfortunate. And I'm encouraged by some of the work that's going on there, but I don't have any, any easy uh, fixes there, but that um, uh, people are actively working on that, which is, which is encouraging. Paul, did you have a, uh, do you want to ask a question? I'm Paul Carr. Just want to remind you, uh, St. Francis of Assisi and his Franciscan order are very strong, uh, on their relationship to nature. That's part of our Christian tradition, very much a part of it. And then in the 1800s, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson's uh, essay on nature, and then his uh, disciple, uh, Henry David Thoreau, with his uh, book, uh, Walden. Uh, and Walden is still very much in print. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, the Thoreau Society is, is very active. They have an annual meeting every year. I'm a member of it. So mm -hmm. I must say that, they, that there's the, uh, the, the spiritual aspect of nature that Tradition is very much with us, and and I think particularly in Emerson and Thoreau would be the most recent from the 1800s. But let's yeah. not forget Saint Francis. Yes, no, I agree, and I and I um, uh, value and appreciate those those authors and their and their words and thoughts. I I also have found that within you know really conservative corners of Christianity, they th those those words just don't resonate with them. They they see it as uh, borderline idolatry. They see it as, as you know, it's it's uh, it's getting in the way of sharing the gospel. We should be we should be about uh, you know reaching people's uh, you know re reaching people for Christ. And this is a, a, a side note. It's a distraction. Um, I, I think that we have seen it as a false dichotomy, which has caused, has caused a lot of problems. That we have to choose either the gospel, which is saving souls, or doing the environment, but we can't do both, which is just mm -hmm. nonsense. Course. But, so I agree. I love those those um, those names, but um, there are many people that just don't don't find them as as um, as cr Christian enough. I think, <laughs> unfortunately, Saint Francis was certainly Christian. <laughs> goodness, goodness, wasn't he? Yes. What a what a witness. Yeah. Hale, in the in the just a couple minutes, we got less than this this window. Uh, what 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 is what current animation project are you working on? Yeah, uh, so right now we just um, uh, released a, a, a video last couple weeks ago on um, the intersection of, uh, of, of sort of science and, and philosophy. And right now we're, I'm about to release a video, I think on, on Monday or Tuesday actually, that's not as animated, but it's talking about the um, relationship between humans and animals in, in scripture and the, the pattern of sort of when, when humans are, are right with God, they are living at, at peace with, an, with animals. And when humans distance themselves from God, then, then as we see in the prophets, nature falls apart. But we've got a, a long list of videos that are um, in the works um, and coming out. So thanks for, for asking, Greg. Steve. 
Yeah, Ryan, a com- and to Lydia, too, a comment on experiencing nature. I, too, live in an urban area. Uh, and I think we can relate that we see buildings, we don't see stars. We're, we're, we're like uh, with a, a kettle cover over us. Uh, I had an experience of going to a retreat out uh, in a very natural area. I walked away from the lights of the grounds and noticed the Milky Way just very profound. And all the people in the retreat really didn't notice it. So I asked them to turn out some lights and we took a walk. And what it was was profound for the urban people, just the grandeur. Mm -hmm. And in talking with them, I found to talk about the grandeur of, of the galaxies and the stars, they weren't too interested in the details of this star and, you know, the temperature of that. They was just, Andromeda Galaxy was out that night, and with binoculars, we could see it. Uh, we, and so, yeah, just to, uh, it was an opportunity for experience that I didn't realize, but even the lights of the retreat center <laughs> put a kettle over us. Yeah, you know, I, I had the opportunity once to teach a group of students from Tokyo, uh, Japan, and they had never seen yet stars, really. They had never seen squirrels. And they and it, it's, it's interesting, actually, to in, encounter nature through the eyes of somebody that has that background. Um, it, it reminds me, of, you know, Mark Twain has had this quote that how he had started out his journeys on the Mississippi River and was just enthralled by everything he saw. But over time, it became sort of boring and dead to him and that he had to remind himself of the beauty that he encountered. And I think we have to do that with science as well. We, we are so immersed in it. We study it, it becomes part of our daily life or the park that we go for a walk through. I have to be reminded um, sometimes that, that this is, that this should, that this em- emotional stirring that we're experiencing, it's more than just a sort of a, like a curiosity that this should draw us into relationship with God that's a message that I just think is too too absent in, uh, in on Sunday mornings. It's missing from from uh, the, the the standard fare that we get uh, in church, or at least the churches that that I that I was raised in. Well, this brings up another matter. I was part of a ranger group uh, quite a few years ago, and we uh, it was basically inner city and they had not been out of the city. It was amazing. Uh, so we took a trip to the local mountains, which were not far away. Uh, these normally I call them squirrely kids. I never seen a squirrel, and they were no longer squirrely. They were the best behaved kids uh, because they wanted to go back. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and uh, it, they're they're just little opportunities. That one took some work, uh, but it was quite the experience. Uh, I wanted. There were a few uh, questions that popped up in the chat. Um, and suggestions as well that uh, I wanted to. Um, uh, reference at least a little bit. I, uh, Lauren Randolph talks about Aldo Leopold and his land ethic. I, I just love Aldo Leopold. I inc- have my students read everything. I agree that the process of putting together a Christian land ethic, which I also do with my students, is a great experience. Um, and I encourage anybody that has not read a Sand County Almanac to do so. It is beautifully written um, and is deeply insightful. Um, John asks, how is uh, uh, Christian environmental justice different from non-Christian environmental justice? Are are they the same or different? And I, you know, I I see that as a similar question to, you know, environmentalism versus creation care. I I think that they're not different in practice, but they are different in in purpose. Um, I, I find uh, you know, my, my Christianity to be so deeply aligned with environmentalism because uh, it's so easy to define creation as inherently good. The goodness comes from within. It is, it is you know, God talks in Genesis 1 says, God saw that it was good. And so that, that, that goodness is inherent. And from the secular perspective, I think it's a little bit harder to say that goodness is inherent. We have to assign it. So I, I do see a difference in why, but not much of a difference in how. I do think most secular efforts to pursue environmental justice are right in line with what we ought to be doing as Christians, um, but perhaps a very different motivation for, what, for why we do it. Although I'm sure there's, there's nuance to that. I'd be interested to hear other people's thoughts on that. I would oversimplify it as the difference between Earth's 
stewardship and earth worship. Yes. Yep. Yep. And I think, and, you know, many Christians are concerned with idolatry and we should be, uh, that's, that's absolutely something that we need to resist. But I also hear that because it could become idolatry as a reason to sort of disengage from environmentalism altogether. I, 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 it's a false dichotomy that I think has, has given people permission to mentally check out from that issue. And instead I say, let's, let's resist the idolatry. Let's make sure that doesn't become a problem, but at the same time, stay engaged with, uh, with active creation care. Hi, uh, I, I didn't plan this. The hand was up by mistake, but I'll just oh, chime in on something. Sometimes in the big picture, I think we get misfocused on the fall. And there is the idea that, there was chaos before creation. Several cosmogonies have this, and that creation itself is a stepwise bringing order, uh, separating the word badal for divide means to bring order. And there were six days uh, with evening and morning, but the seventh didn't have an evening and morning. The evening and morning is completion, and it's considered we're in the seventh day. So that seven is here for a purpose, and the six days serve the seven. Can we take a larger view uh, that the fall was perhaps expected because Christ in 1 Peter 1, 19 and 20 says he was foreordained before the foundation of the world that he would die. Thus, he knew that there would be a problem. Perhaps we're in a battle in the seventh day to finish out the separation of goodness and evil, and that this environment allows that. We as the agents made in his image and after his likeness to do his will. And that the ultimate end here at the marriage feast of the Lamb is that there is an ultimate separation to heaven and hell forever. Goodness and evil are separated. Sometimes I think we look at the fall and we think that goodness, that Genesis 131, it, things were very good. I ask very good for what? Uh, mm -hmm. For what purpose? And I think it's the purpose of the seventh day that it was to serve. And we're here to do a work of separating wheats and tares. They're intertwined at the roots. They can't be separated other than production of fruit of wheat heads. That's what we do. Right. It's eschatological mm -hmm. uh, in that parable in Matthew 13, the second parable. So the bigger view sometimes gives us a purpose for why we are here to separate goodness of evil and that we're important as his agents. And let's preserve the place and do our work, yep. perhaps by focusing on forgiveness, which is a topic in another person's speech. Yep. Yep. Oh, that's great. I, I mean, I, I think there, there's been a lot of good work uh, of late talking about the fall uh, in the context um, to some degree of, of creation care. Uh, you know, uh, Romans 8 uh, paints a picture of creation waiting for, uh, you know, the, the sons of, of men to be revealed, that, that it's waiting for us to be the humans that we were created to, to be so that we can help creation fulfill its purpose. Um, so, I, yeah, I think there's a lot of good work um, going on in that area. Uh, and, and yes, certainly, you know, we are, we are here to, to help creation be, uh, be fruitful, uh, be glorifying to God, that, um, you know, be good for us to live in and, and thrive in. And so I think that's, that's part of our calling is to help be God's hand and feet in, in bringing that all about. Well, you know, the, 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 the um, garden wasn't perfect because Satan slithered in. Sure, sure. Right. Yep. Yeah, no, I, no, I don't. I think it was it was good. I don't I don't find the word perfect in the, in the, the opening pages of, of Genesis. So, I, yep, it's a, a misnomer, I think. Well, uh, if there are no further questions, I certainly appreciate all of your interest and um, uh, look forward to interacting with you um, uh, throughout the rest of the conference.